Ciao, and welcome to the Frontier Space Podcast, a dialogue about how space technology and exploration are transforming our solar system. Welcome to the Frontier Space Podcast, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you, Cole. Thank you for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Yes. Um, really excited for today's conversation and I uh, hope uh, awesome to hear about your uh, your recent daughter as of last week and, and, and hope everything is uh, uh, wonderful in, in Pennsylvania. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Always, always nice to get more future astronauts um, in, into the pipeline. So um, yeah, it's, it's great to, great to have time to be here. I uh, remember reading about this, uh, uh, this fast uh, landing pad concept. Uh, um, I, I think last year or, or the year before, and it, uh, I, I love the idea and I think it's really transformative in nature to how we view our arrival to uh, planetary bodies. <laughs> Thank, thank you. Yeah, this was a very, very fun idea and very, very fun program. It's, it's very sci-fi, and so it's gotten a lot of um, attention across kind of the, the space community simply because it, it seems almost too outlandish to work. Uh, but thankfully, it was funded for some research under the NASA NIAC program that stands for NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts, and that's kind of their future, future uh, R&D space where they take the really, really crazy ideas, the really, really hard stuff and, and see if it actually um, closes from a, from a physics and engineering standpoint. So we partnered with Texas A&M, uh, University of Central Florida and Honeybee Robotics and put together a really stellar team, of some of the best minds in, in the landing pad area to come and, and look at this problem. And working with NASA was just spectacular. And we came to the conclusion that it's, it's, it's probably feasible. All the math closes. Um, we've focused in on a design that we think will work. And we think it'll solve some, some very interesting problems on, on the surface of the moon. And you and your listeners might ask, why, why actually even look at this? Why does it matter? So... When you go and land on a, on a body like the moon, because there's no atmosphere, once you start kicking up ejecta, there's really not much to stop it until it hits something else. So it can get going really, really fast. Apollo was putting ejecta spray out all around the lander, uh, traveling at three kilometers a second. And they did some, some tests on Apollo 12 where they landed next to uh, Surveyor 3, and they kind of sandblasted the heck out of it on landing and then went and looked at kind of the damage that was done to assess the, the importance of this. And also they, they learned that, you know, at 3000 meters per second, you're actually putting some of this ejecta into to low lunar orbit for, for a time. So it's a pretty important part of the, the physics of, of landing spacecraft, how to do it safely. We want to make sure that things we're sending to the moon are being good neighbors to everybody else up there. Um, you don't want a large lander to come down and then take out LRO or potentially impact someone else's uh, South Pole lander that may still be active in doing research. So it's all a good neighbor philosophy and FAST came about because you want to, we want to solve the chicken and egg problem of how do you actually land something on a landing pad when you need to traditionally land something there first to build the landing pad. So FAST aims to solve that problem by building the landing pad on landing, which is kind of the interesting sci-fi portion of it. And it required some very interesting material science. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, so what exactly is this, you know, in-flight alumina spray technique FAST that, that you can, you know, rapidly manufacture these, these landing pads? Yes. And I'm very, I'll just say I'm very proud of the backronym to get the, the FAST in there. So... What this did is, is it's an adaptation of a material coating technology that we use here on Earth. And it's, I've used it in aircraft engine manufacturing, and it's used in spray coatings for all manner of things. It's called um, HVOF, high velocity um, oxidizer. And then the F is something I cannot 
remember off the top of my head, but it's it's a spray technique where they create molten power particles and then splat them into surfaces. And once they all splat together, they, they start to adhere and then you can build up coatings. Uh, typically this is done in the grams per minute type flow rates and it's done in the kind of centimeters distance regime. So it, it's small scale, short distances, uh, but it's a proven method and the physics has been studied for, for decades now. So there's some good solid bedrock of, of physics principles to, to build on and, and extrapolate from for looking at FAST. What FAST changes up is it, it morphs it into kilograms per second and 30 to 50 meter deployment height. So we're really changing up the game and we're also uh, deploying it directly under the lunar surface, which is never really done here on, on Earth. It's, it's always sprayed onto very prepared, usually metallic or ceramic surfaces. So you get really good particle adhesion and you get really well-defined interface properties between the ceramics and the, and the base material. Can't do that on the moon because it's an unconsolidated regolith. So we actually did a little civil engineering and we figured out how to remotely condition and prepare the surface for the, uh, for the particle deposition, you know, from 30 to 50 meters away. So some really interesting engineering. And um, I sent you that paper link, which gets into some of the kind of the, the nitty gritty engineering details, if your listeners would like to dive in deeper. Yes, thanks for sending me. Uh, I can plan to uh, include that in, in the uh, description here. Um, I was wondering, how is the experiment testing going here um, on Earth? And, and Yeah, so for, for testing this concept, we really kind of took a iterative and test some of the fundamental assumptions uh, quickly and on, on like bench scale prototypes to start things off. So working with UCF, we started doing impact studies uh, where we looked at the impact and relative momentum of how the craters formed for these different part particles at different velocities, different masses, um, different impact media. And so we, we looked at all of that. Uh, we also simultaneously built some computer models in, in CFD to also model this and, and match those up against the experiments. And we created kind of a momentum versus cratering um, analysis. So we could use that to figure out how we were going to condition, condition the, the surface. So that was one set of experiments. And it was really, really cool because we found, we found some stuff we weren't expecting, such as when we get particles that are impacting in, in very close um, time proximity to each other and, and very close distance proximity to, to each other, it changes the cratering dynamics on the surface even for very small particles. So you can actually kind of control and, and tune how much splash and disruption of the surface you get as you're deploying the landing pad to kind of optimize the, the, the surface compression, the performance and the interface layer. So you, you need to build an interface layer between the lunar regolith and the, the hard top, top coat of the landing pad, which takes the brunt of the thermal, thermal impact and you do that by kind of building up a graded layer of, of particles um, on, the, on the surface. And so that was one series of tests we did. Uh, another series of tests we did focused on how does this material actually perform when you hit it with a rocket engine under landing conditions. So we took one of our uh, engines, uh, 100 pound thrust, which kind of equates to a, a fairly decent sized lunar engine when you do a conversion to uh, heat flux in a, in a lunar environment, you get very different performance when you're in a vacuum. So it's a much harsher test environment here on earth. And we have a very, very cool test stand that actually lowers while the engine is firing. So you can directly simulate the trajectory of a, of a spacecraft landing on the lunar surface. We've been using that for some testing with NASA and it's, it's, just brilliantly cool. The end result of that was we tested some, some coupons of the Illumina Ceramic we're, we're looking at 
using and uh, they, they performed quite well. They, they stood up to the expected lunar conditions and beyond. And even though these weren't manufactured with the fast process, they kind of give us a good peek at, yeah, this is, a, this is a suitable material for this use case. And it gives us margin. So that's always a nice place to be from a technical perspective. Nice. Um, it's, uh, because of testing there and, and um, I think um, <clears throat> would love to hear more about the, the types of compressive strengths you guys were able to achieve as well. Definitely, definitely. So I mentioned that the conditions on the moon are, are a little different than Earth because there's no atmosphere. So your, your rocket plume tends to spread out and that really helps us out from a stress perspective. So you get a really broad plume impinging on, on the surface relative to Earth where, so in, instead of say a meter on the moon on Earth, you get like in three centimeters of, of impingement distance for that, for that or impingement diameter for that core plume. So you can spread that out, that load out over an absolutely huge area. And that lets us keep the thickness of the pad fairly, low, fairly thin, uh, about 1.25 millimeters for um, something the size of the, the Blue Origin Blue Moon Lander. And um, so that's, that was kind of the driving, driving force there. And then the material is thermally stable enough, it can take the, the heat flux and the, the temperatures of the, of the gases. An interesting point on the structure is because it is so thin, it's not designed to take the, the weight of the entire landed lander. So the landing pads would actually crush through the, the thin pad. And that's just part of, the, part of the design. This isn't intended to be a long duration landing pad for a lunar base. It's designed to be able to deploy a pad uh, to land wherever you want safely and kind of pre prevent that ejecta plume. Uh, the pad would stay together long enough for you to then ascend back to orbit so you could launch from it and it would take benefit there, but not a, not a long-term base level solution. You want something that's a little thicker. And one of the reasons that we did that, it was a very intentional choice, was because mass Mass is so expensive when you go to the moon. So you really want to create the thinnest pad possible to stop the ejecta problem and then kind of hone in on your, on your optimal solution. It's not only the mass of the material you're bringing to build the landing pad, it's also uh, the mass of the propellant that you need to deploy this when you're, when you're hovering. It takes about 12, 12 to 15 seconds to deploy this um, on your final descent from you know, 30 to 50 meters altitude. So the spacecraft has to, to null its descent velocity and then, then hover there for, for a few seconds, which can be, uh, that's a, you know, huge propellant sink and that, that all costs money and, and launch mass. It's uh, wonderful, and, and it sounds like there were um, there there were quite a bit of challenges to the deployment of landing pads that, um, and and in general on the surface of the moon that that this 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 fast concept really like like paves the way. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it paves the way is a good way to to think about it, and um, I think it'll. It'll help the scientists too. It'll, it'll keep everything on the external of the, the vehicles safer. When you get the larger larger landers, you, you tend to get ejecta kicked up back towards the landing vehicle as well that like, damaged a, a sensor on Mars Curiosity, for example. So we don't want instruments and science to be damaged during landing. And then also this uh, kind of protects the lunar regolith and keeps it from getting kind of permeated with the rocket exhaust. So there's a bunch of different types of propellants and rockets you can use to land on the moon, but each one has different chemistry in the, in the plume and you start 
pressure injecting that into the lunar regolith as you as you make these craters. So you, you start changing the area around the lander, and that makes science a lot harder by uh, kind of capping it off. You can keep that pristine subsurface for um, analysis near the near the spacecraft. And also, if you're astronaut, then you don't have to worry about kicking up as much dust as you're going to and from your from your vehicle. And, as they found during Apollo, that was a that was a huge huge problem. So NASA is doing a lot of research in that area right now as well. Yes, um, yeah. I wonder if there's a way to we could help quantify, you know, just how much dust you know you guys could um, help uh, pave and, and 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 mitigate in terms of quantifying the ejecta plumes. Um, yeah, the, the current design, which requires about a 300 kilograms of uh, mass delivered to the, to the lunar surface, um, and that's with kind of the, the engines and the, and the alumina and, and everything kind of as a, as a bolt-on package, so it can be used on any number of, of lunar landers, would, would create about a six meter diameter landing pad. So that would kind of be a dust-free zone around, around the lander. Um, and um, one of the challenges was thinking through might be the um, the that these um, the exhausts might form some kind of uneven terrains and, and surfaces in terms of the you know really the two uh, D chemistry involved. Um, in, in, in terms of some kind of, um, you know, if the um, particles ejected, they're kind of out of plane, if that makes sense, or, or if there's some kind of um, uneven surface, even though it's such a small uh, coating. I'm not sure I... Are you talking about deposition on the uneven surface? So like if there was a rock there or kind of a small crater? Yeah, like if, um, for example, if we wanted to, you know, uh, make a, a larger coating deposition um, in terms of the, you know, the crystalline structure of, of, the, of that, like of a larger layered coating, you know, how many of those, um, particles are in phase and out of phase and um, like aligned and, and misaligned, I guess. Mm. So if you're, if you're referring to the, how the pad cools and, and solidifies, that's definitely something we're gonna have to be looking more into and, and, and figuring out via test as to what kind of crystal structures we get as, and what kind of phase of the Alumina that we we get as they they cool in the interface layers, um, they impact warm but not liquid, so they're already partially partially cooled and they you get some localized melting right at the impingement point from all the the point stresses and then the intent is to get them to and I, I love that the technical term is splat but they basically splat into pancakes and, and adhere together. So you get a lot of kind of lightly centered together particulates. Um, and we'll have to look at that localized heating at the point, point of direct impingement is to, to see if that's enough to kind of join them together and get any sort of larger uh, crystallization effects as, as it cools or that might actually happen to the, the top couple uh, layers from the, the heating on landing, because you can, you'll, you'll reheat it back up and uh, it shouldn't you know, get to the point where it starts to, uh, to spall off too badly, but uh, you'll definitely get some fairly substantial heating right at the center line of the engine. Also wondering how we could collect the data on the surface of these geochemical interactions. Uh, well, that's, we're going to do much more testing here. We're going to 
during the next phase. We're, we're waiting to hear back from NASA if we get funded, uh, but we'll be you know, doing some small scale testing and try to get this into a vacuum chamber and you know, see what kind of particle adhesion we're, we're getting, what, the, what does the chemistry look like? We can do cross sections and, and SEM studies to kind of really dig into what's going on from a physics perspective. And the nice part about that is, although this is designed for the moon, um, if we find some really fascinating and ways to kind of extend the range and extend the mass throughput of these coding technologies, that's directly applicable here on Earth. It's a multiple billion dollar industry. Things get coded all the time, you know, from the inside of jet engines all the way through automotive, robotics, medical equipment. So if we can find ways to reduce the cost, make it easier, uh, it's have a, a rather broad impact across society. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, definitely. Uh, I was w wondering what are some of the mathematical equations that really underpin the deposition of this high pressure injection system? Yeah, the, the, so the, the math of how you actually pick up the particles and then train them in, in the fluid is, is kind of you know, Bernoulli's equation kind of dominates that. And then you can do modifications for particle loading and, you know, lunar gravity and different, different gases. We actually use the, the fuel, uh, which is high, and gaseous hydrogen for the engine to pick up the particles and then train them and then goes into the combustion chamber and combusts. And you get some um, pretty wild yet to be studied combustion effects from having a lot of non-combustible particles intermixed with your uh, fuel and oxidizer in your rocket engine. So that's that's a very interesting problem that we also hope to be studying during uh, future future phases of this. Um, from there, once they are traveling to the to the lunar surface, you you have your surface radiation to to black body uh, equations. Uh, so that dominates how fast your the particles cool, and that affects your deployment altitude. That's why we selected thirty. 30 meters deployment height. That's, you know, just on the edge of where we would expect the regolith to start getting severely disrupted by the landing plume. Um, and just high enough that we can, we can still get the particles in the, in the right thermal regime on, on impact. So it's all about thermodynamics in, in this one, thermodynamics and velocity. And then on uh, impact, you, there's a series of uh, splat equations from the, uh, the HVOF coding textbooks that you can use and also uh, Hertz contact stresses for the solid particles that we, we use to build up the interface layer. Awesome, yes. Um, yeah, these codings, they're kind of transforming, you know, everything these days, <laughs> it's wild. Uh, Pretty interesting technology and, and lots of wide use cases across multiple industries. Yes, both abiotic and biotic. Yeah. Material science is, is good for that. And we have another technology called PermiAM, which is creating porous, uh, engineered porosity for additive manufacturing components. We use it in our rocket engines for transpiration cooling, but we can tune the porosity such that you can actually mimic bone. Uh, so if you want to use it for medical implants such as hips, you can tune the porosity so it matches the bone. You can also tune it so it matches the, the modulus of the bone so that when your repaired hip joint starts flexing, they, it's a much stronger interface between the bone and the implant. So you, you're less prone to cracking, for example, from the, from the differential bending of the, of the components. So material science is great. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, and so we could essentially use this high pressure ejection system for um, the deposition of coatings, you, you know, in living systems. And uh, I'm curious on the design of the, such an apparatus. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think that's, that's probably another project into itself. Um, 
was wondering uh, if, um, <clears throat> if there are certain um, challenges that may arise from, uh, uh, you know, ejecting some of the particles into the combustion chamber. If, if you may consider taking some, uh, some nanoparticles and, and, and uh, you know, almost spray them like a hose downward um, instead of in such a high operating um, environment. Which which may may limit some of the um, materials. It, it, operating in the combustion chamber definitely influenced the materials we we chose. That's one of the reasons we went with alumina. It's such a wonderfully inert material. It's an alumina ceramic, um, not alumina the metal. If you use alumina the metal, it'll actually combust, and they use that in solid rocket solid rocket engines, but uh, the inert alumina ceramic powder is, is, is just a wonderful material. Um, you can get it in very small grain sizes and then um, it doesn't like to interact or oxidize much as you're, as you're going through the combustion environment. Um, though, again, the, the effects of large particle loadings in combustion is Definitely something that needs needs more study. Um, it's not something that's that's looked at often here on Earth. Um, even the terrestrial HVOF systems they they inject their particles downstream of the of the main combustion chamber because they simply don't need as much velocity or or heat um, in their particles. But for deploying it on the moon, we need to to really optimize the the system to the nth degree, and and we need the extra uh, thermal and, and velocity uh, that, that we pick up in the combustion chamber itself. It also minimizes the dispersion as you, if you put it right in along the center line, you, you minimize particle dispersion as it goes through the nozzle. Otherwise, again, because you're in a vacuum, you'll get an extraordinarily wide deployment area and that just wastes material mass and, and takes more time to deposit the thickness you need. It's all about all the little ways to optimize the system to, to minimize mass and, and hover time for the lander. Yeah. Um, yeah, speaking of, you know, hovering, uh, was, recall this one research study and project from MIT researchers on some hovering, um, you know, vehicle or system that could help fabricate you know, it, a very similar concept, but it, it's just like a hovering rocket where, where you can apply this um, to manufacture roads and, and extend it mm. to other buildings. But, um, yeah. I'd be interested to, to see that, definitely. Yes. Send, send me a copy if you have that available. Love to yes. read it. Some kind of a, a blend of the both concepts. Yeah, um, recall in um, the back, uh, in 2016, there was a team, they, they produced this concrete in situ from Mars regular simulant um, without any water. And it, it, you know, they took sulfur and they heated it by 240 degrees Celsius with, with aggregate simulant and, and molten sulfur to yield a 50 um, megapascal compressive strength. Fascinating work going on with uh, material science on, on the moon and Mars, and I know NASA has a number of uh, programs and, and competitions um, where people are developing structures, materials, kind of minimizing uh, down mass and, and maximizing ISRU. So it's definitely a, a vibrant field, and it's great to see all the, the innovation from all the different corners of the, of the world on it. Yes. Um was wondering, you know, about all the possible combinations of nanoparticles that could be ejected in the, in the regolith um, and, and if we could potentially in situ deposit, you know, this, this uh, two centimeter layer of air gel or, or possibly a, sim a similar polymer com uh, binder to, to strengthen silica sand or even um, uh, the potential ways to use this coating the deposition process to increase the bioavailability of um, regolith and um, 
a part of the challenge was, um, you know, there, there's such minimal bioavailable organics in, in the regolith and, and, and you know, uh, a lack of bioavailable water in, in the soils and on the moon and at greater depths too. And so, you know, could we potentially eject some organics, um, uh, you know, such as hydrogen, nitrogen, and carbon into the soil and, 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 and then in what sequence, but, um, uh, you know, the combustion of organics usually forms carbon dioxide and water and, um, and, and but, but the soils on earth, they're, they're a major source of carbon dioxide. Um, and, and so, I don't know, uh, there's a lot of potential possibilities, you know, these zero valent iron nanoparticles that can remediate these subsurface contaminants. Um, and, and then even like the porosity gradient um, in the subsurface, I think is, something to consider if we're looking to really uh, inoculate, you know, the, the soils with all sorts of uh, bacteria and, and plants. Um, yes. Are, are you thinking of the, about this for, for Earth or for the moon? For both. I, I think for uh, a lot of rocky bodies. I, I think it's... Uh, um, I, I'm curious, though, how the the depth of deposition that we get such organics from the uh rock exhaust plume uh the the depth of of injected kind of contaminants that you would get from a from a rocket exhaust plume vary greatly by the by the size of the rocket uh, if you get a rocket firing close to the surface, you can get what's called a, a deep cratering effect to form. And so you can create a, a crater as, as deep as the, as the rocket plume in, in roughly 0.4 tenths of a second. So, so, so four tenths of a second, you can, you can, you know, something the size of like an Apollo engine, you could get down to a meter pretty quick if they, if they were, were firing a little closer to the surface, Apollo turned off their engine um, a little above the surface and, and fell the last you know, half meter, two meter. So you get pressure and contaminant intrusion in, into that. And you, you see it in vacuum chamber tests here on Earth too. Everything kind of permeates and, and percolates through using the, the Darcy flow equations. So it happens. It's one of the things we're trying to prevent. Yes. Um, yeah, you know, if we want to create these, you know, lush green parks and environments on the moon and Mars, um, the, um, you know, soil components on Earth is around 45% mineral matter, 25% water, and then 25% air and, and porosity, and then only 5% organic matter. And just curious if this, this fast, you know, concept and, particle deposition uh, could help form such an organic and, and nutrient-rich environment for, uh, for life, yes. And, and... Um, honestly, probably not. The, this, the system is designed to have minimal impact on, on surface chemistry, simply because we want to minimize the impact that this has on, on science. We wanna really keep a pristine, unaltered surface below the pad. Uh, for the for science to to go and, and analyze, and so if we can, we 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 explicitly do not want to provide any sort of modification to to the material. Okay, gotcha. Yes. Um, well, congratulations on the uh, on the exciting uh, uh, mission recently as well. Yes. Thank you, thank you. We're um, we're excited for our our, our Mastin Mission One and our, our Zeline lander, and we also recently announced uh, Mastin Mission Two. We're starting to put that together and, and sign payloads up for that. So that's coming soon. And if any of your listeners want to send something to the moon, definitely please reach out to us. You can find us at mastin.aero on, on the web. Awesome. Um, I'd love to see everything you're doing and keep up the great work. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hope that 2022 is a great year for fast landing pads, and I hope we get to uh, hope we get the opportunity to work towards kind of full-scale prototypes and get this to the moon in support of Artemis and, and every other 
every other lander. Yes. Thanks so much, Matthew. And yes. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. We uh, really appreciate it.